so beyond the pale of what scientists are doing. This is completely immoral. Pelosi's the best. You're a Republican, by the way. Instead of saying balding, say your area of recession, this makes people feel a little, a little better about it. The Senate being equally divided, the vice president votes in the affirmative and the motion is agreed to. The clerk will report the nomination. Vice President Mike Pence had to break a 50-50 tie in the Senate to advance the nomination of Thomas Farr to be a district court judge in North Carolina. Farr has defended North Carolina district maps and voter ID laws that courts later found to be racially motivated. All 49 Senate Democrats and Republican Jeff Flake voted no. The first generic competitor to Milan's EpiPen has gone on sale, and it's not providing much actual competition. Teva's version costs $300 for two, the same price as Milan's own generic version. But Teva's pen does offer an upside. It's available. Manufacturing issues have led to a supply shortage of Milan's generic EpiPen since May. The Netherlands National Rail Company is planning to set up a commission to pay reparations to Holocaust survivors and their relatives. NS operated trains for occupying Nazi forces during World War II, sending Jews to a Dutch deportation camp. The rail company called that period, quote, a black page in the history of our country and our company, saying it won't know until next year how reparation payments will work or who will get them. After an unprecedented 12 consecutive draws forced the World Chess Championship into a round of tiebreakers, Norway's Magnus Carlsen has once again been crowned the winner, beating American challenger Fabiano Caruana. A researcher in China says he worked in secret, without the knowledge of his university, his peers, or his government, to pull off a scientific first that has the potential to alter the human gene pool. He Jiankui says he helped create the world's first genetically edited babies. He claims they're resistant to HIV. Not that he's released any data to prove it. His announcement came with a slick YouTube video, not a journal where other scientists could check his work. Two beautiful little Chinese girls named Lulu and Lala came crying into the world as healthy as any other babies a few weeks ago. The publicity blitz seemed time to come just before his talk today in Hong Kong at the Human Genome Editing Summit, where he blamed a leak. Uh, first, I must apologize that this result leaked unexpected. He was hardly known in the scientific community until this week. He's 34. He's previously authored a study on the gene editing technique CRISPR, but hasn't published anything major. Still, he drew a crowd of journalists and bioethicists who've been debating the risks of gene edited humans for years. The thing was that it was sur sur surreal in the sense that we're coming here exactly to debate these kinds of questions when no one was thinking that there actually are two babies in the world who have had their embryos genetically edited. Robert Klitzman runs the bioethics program at Columbia University. I was shocked because this is so beyond the pale of what scientists are doing or considering acceptable to do. This is completely immoral. There has been consensus among leading countries, including China, that you should not be taking edited embryos and implanting them in women to have children at this point because we just do not know the risks and the risks could be severe. Our DNA consists of three billion letters. So gene editing is when we take some of the letters in the sequence of three billion letters and we change them. We take out some that can lead to a increased risk of disease, for instance. CRISPR is a technology that uses molecules to find certain sequences of letters and to remove them. So we can go in with sort of molecular scissors and clip out part of a gene that's no good. He says his work doesn't come close to creating a designer baby. Gene surgery is and should remain a technology for healing, enhancing IQ or selecting higher or eye color is not what a loving purple does. That should be banned. He claims that his advancement may have prevented the twin's father from passing on his HIV and a life of stigma. But there are other ways to prevent this kind of transmission, 
and scientists have no idea what side effects might arise from disabling the gene that He targeted. It's like predicting the weather. We can barely predict the weather 24 hours from now in New York City or anywhere in the world. So we're trying to make predictions now for an embryo of what diseases it's going to have 80 years from now. We're not very good at that kind of predictions. In altering the genes of an embryo, there are all kinds of unintended consequences. That's why the consensus in the scientific community up till now is that it's okay to experiment on altering the genes in embryos, but you should not at this point take the embryo and put it into a woman's body to create a child. China's government has pressured scientists like He to make advancements in CRISPR research to get ahead in the genetic equivalent of the space race. There is thought to be a lot of money in this. I would suspect that when it is found that someone is able to, in fact, have a way of altering the genes of a child and have a healthy child, that they will try to patent that and try to earn hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, if they're able to get rid of uh, major diseases, they may win a Nobel Prize. China allows scientists to edit human embryos for research but only for up to 14 days after fertilization. He's current employer, the Southern University of Science and Technology, says he's been on unpaid leave since February, and that it had no knowledge of He's work, which it considers a serious violation of academic norms. It's now investigating. So is the institution where he did his postdoc, Rice University, which is looking closer at the role of one of its professors, who frequently collaborated with her and defended him, saying the families understood the risks. There is still no proof of her success, or even if the twins exist. But if it's a hoax, it may only encourage the real thing. He's opened up Pandora's box in many ways. Uh, I think that he has suggested that this is possible and that there may now be other scientists who say, well, I'm gonna try it too. Today, Nancy Pelosi faced the first of two votes on her path to reclaiming the title of Speaker of the House. Behind closed doors, the Democrats that will make up the majority in the House voted to make her leader. Again, 203 yes votes and 32 no's. Good afternoon, everyone. And I do believe it is a good afternoon. And it was uh, so inspiring to hear my colleagues place my name in nomination. Nobody was running against her, so Pelosi was always going to win this one. Now it's time for pundits to parse how much or how little she won by and to spend the next month speculating over whether Pelosi will win the speakership on the floor of the House. But in the wake of historic midterms, the public is getting a vivid lesson in how it all happens, thanks to Pelosi's struggle to keep her caucus in line. Madam Leader, you've been a leader for a long time. You've twisted a lot of arms. What was different about counting the votes this time and getting the votes? This is all the same. I've always had, a, 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 not an opponent, but opposition. Today, it didn't materialize into an opponent. But um, no, it, every, uh, every Congress, I spend a lot of time listening to members, new members and members who are returning to hear what their prospects are for the future. Those conversations led her to promising Congresswoman Marsha Fudge a subcommittee chairmanship, so she wouldn't run against her. Congressman Brian Higgins signed a letter pledging to oppose Pelosi, but a few days later, he backed down after persuasive talks with leadership renewed his confidence that more voices will be heard, and that Pelosi would work with him to make Medicare an option for Americans at age 50. And the new members who have been very upfront about what they want, plum appropriations committee assignments and promises to address climate change, are finding themselves moving in Pelosi's direction. Because being a new member of Congress means you may have Twitter, but you're lacking power, and Pelosi has spent many years amassing it. Pelosi's the best. She really understands this stuff. You're a Republican, by the way. I'm a Republican. Okay. Look, I, I, but I'm just saying, Nancy is very good at what she does. Uh, she produced Dodd-Frank, she produced Obamacare, and she produced a stimulus package when she was Speaker. She was very effective from a legislative point of view. The, the, the speakership is, is no place for nice people. You have to be a little bit tough to be a leader in this Congress, because if you sit back and let everybody be free agents, you never get anything done. Being the person connected to a ton of outside groups and funding streams means you can use them to push around unruly members. 
Heavy hitters from the Democratic base, like labor unions and gun reform groups, are supporting Pelosi, and they're willing to spend money on campaigns, hers and other people's. So people on the inside and outside think she's effective, but I know what you're thinking. Nobody likes her. Connor Lamb, another two-faced Pelosi liberal. He'll say anything to get elected. And you're not wrong about that. According to Wesleyan University, during the 2018 election, Pelosi was the most targeted congressional leader featured in thousands of negative ads. And national polls tend to show almost half the country has an unfavorable view of her. Of course, the thing that makes people hate her is also the thing that makes her an effective speaker. You piss a lot of people off when you have to keep them in line and when you get shit done. Thank you all very much. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you. Dolkanisa doesn't have the things that most people who successfully lobby Congress have. He doesn't have a lot of money behind him or a powerful group. Instead, he's the head of the World Uyghur Congress, a group that advocates for China's Muslim minority. His main asset is his own story. I was a student's leader in, in Estergista, 1980s. I was host arrested for months and I was kicked also from the university. When I came to the exile, I continue uh, working on the right of the Uyghur people. So you do a lot of these kind of meetings all around the world. What's different about doing it in D.C. versus somewhere else? Well, as you know, the situation is really terrible now for the Uyghurs. And if the U.S. Uh, really concerning, really speak up the uh, current situation, it will be more useful. Issa is from the Xinjiang province of northwest China. The 10 million Uyghurs he represents want independence and freedom from an unrelenting effort by China to suppress their religion and dilute their culture. Some Uyghurs have resorted to violence, and China has used that as a justification for a major crackdown. In August, the UN accused Beijing of holding about 1 million Uyghurs in huge internment camps. China calls them re-education centers. These alleged human rights violations are starting to get noticed in Washington. So Issa is getting meetings with powerful people, like staffers for Senator Bob Menendez, who along with Marco Rubio, introduced a bill to try and protect the Uyghurs a couple weeks ago. My mother passed away 17th of May this year uh, in the camps. She was 70, 80 years old ladies. Even Chinese government took her one year ago. I didn't know that, and uh, in the, he, uh, she passed away in the camp. Thank you very much, uh, you know, again, for, for taking the time to come up here and to, to meet and help educate us. What can we do that can actually be effective to get Beijing to change its, its thinking, change its approach, mm-hmm. change its policy? Maybe uh, in the G20 meeting, G20 meeting, uh, President Trump uh, is personally, if he could write this case to the Xi Jinping, and it will be more influential also. You have our support, so now we need to make sure that you have the support of of the rest of the Senate. Thank you very much, thank you. Trump could bring it up with Xi this weekend and use the issue as a leverage in trade negotiations. But the president has made it clear that human rights concerns are a distant second to economic ones. The human rights communities were not aware of it. That's a major concern for Nuri Turkel, a Uyghur American lawyer and advocate. You're worried that maybe Trump might use the Uyghurs as a bargaining chip. Like, we'll stop talking about this if you give us five more percent of a tariff on cars or something. To the point, yes. The government business is engaged uh, mostly based on the interest. Mm -hmm. So sometimes moral issues can take take the back seat. What about um, this bill that's in the Senate, this this Menez Rubio bill? We know the senators who are for it. Who do you see as the senators who might be against it? I worry about the senators or members of Congress that have uh, a large businesses, business interest with China or a company that have a, a business interest in China. Today though, the Uyghur community got to air its concerns to a sympathetic audience, the Congressional Executive Committee on China. China's suppression of religious faith and religious communities is real. It is evil. It is too horrendous to ignore. They beat me so hard, and then I 
I tell him, please kill me. And then God will, God will help you. Please kill me. We cannot allow ourselves to or have our foreign policy or our commitment to human rights to be decided by whether or not there's going to be retaliation. What I fear is it's not a high enough priority with so many things going on in the world. And that's why more testimony like the one today uh, is, is, is chilling. This is something from a horror movie, not something that you imagine is happening in the 21st century in the world's second largest economy, soon to be world's largest economy and one of the most powerful countries in the world in China. But it is. But even powerful legislators might not be able to push this president. He didn't take action against Saudi Arabia after journalist Jamal Khashoggi was murdered. You're trying to make a country that is so focused on its economy care about the way a trading partner treats a group of people in the country. I mean, that seems like a tough sell. Yeah, yeah, you are right. It is a difficult and because and the most of some countries just uh, uh, treat partner with China and the most of country, country is just thinking about the economic. Uh, it is not easy, of course. So we have to keep going. We have to hard working. Uh, we don't have another choice. There's balding, thinning people in every city that each of you live in. There's always going to be a market for it. Wade Menendez has been a barber for 13 years. But over the last four, he's found himself catering to a unique clientele, bald men. This is Wade's class, where he instructs barbers and stylists in an emerging trend, men's hair weaves. But Wade prefers a different name. The technical term for this is cranial prothesis or hair prothesis. We want to get out of saying man weave. Guys are not going to be like, I want, you know, I want a man weave. No. All right. I usually call it a hair unit or a hair system. What exactly is a hair unit? It's like a toupee, but the way we do it is we cut it and style it to make it look like it's natural, like it's yours, like it's actually coming out of your scalp, but it's really not. I have a confession. I really wasn't focused on your eyeballs. I was looking at your fade, <laughs> trying to figure out <laughs> if that was a hair unit. Oh, God, yo, everybody always asks me that. Now, if I needed to wear a unit, I would, but I don't. OK, so Wade is blessed with a natural mane, but that hasn't stopped him from becoming the wizard of the weave or master of the faux fro. Okay. Make note of this. Uh, instead of saying balding, say your area of recession, this makes people feel a little, a little better about it. He has nearly 100,000 followers on Instagram, and people flock from across the globe to attend his sessions. You bought a plane ticket, you hotel, hotel and this class. How much was that? Between two and 3,000 pounds altogether. Maybe more, maybe less. But you consider that a worthwhile investment? 100%. Worth every penny. Be realistic. No grown man hairline is all the way down here. You know what I'm saying? So let's be realistic of where we're going to place it. While some men are excited about the unit's potential, many have a problem with wearing one. When it comes to men getting weaved, there's a stigma associated with it. Why do you think that's the case? I think a lot of guys have been against even the females getting weaves. And a lot of it comes from uh, you scared of what your, your boy's going to say. Worried about getting fried by your homies, you know what I mean? A lot of the guys, they come, but they don't want anybody to know. Y'all ready? No? Yeah. Y'all sure? No. <laughs> you like a magician. I done heard Barber Jesus, uh, you know, wizard, all kinds of stuff. A magician never reveals his tricks. So Wade asked Vice News not to film the installation process. We're going to cut the cameras now at this point. You can come back in about, uh, about 30 minutes. While the cameras were off, Wade glued natural and synthetic hair pieces to the scalp, blending them into Sam's natural hair. When I met you earlier, you were about 10 years older. Yeah, so pretty much. What's transpired since well, our first meeting? Well, the hair. I've been coming to Wade for over five years. I lost my hair 
at like late 20s. Okay. So to get this and make it make me feel like I am at least 10 years younger, it just boosted my confidence. And I just, it weighs a blessing. I feel a lot better not having to put a do-rag or a baseball cap. It was something that I was ashamed of with the crown in my head. So now I feel better that I don't have to do that. So what did Wade just do for you? So he just installed the three or four month unit. What was it before? Uh, before I was, I was bald into this. I look like George Jefferson a little bit, you know what I mean? Now tell me, how has these units changed your life overall? I mean, significantly. Before getting this, I started losing my hair like in my early 20s. Um, very depressed, didn't want to go out. If I didn't have like a fresh shape up, I would not go out the house, would not go anywhere. Um, but instantly getting this is like, I don't care. I'll go out, I don't care what time of day it is, from when I run errands, like whatever. With the hair, was an increase of confidence. Absolutely. So you walk in the streets with a new, Absolutely. new strut. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. And, and so yeah. in, the, in the bedroom with the wife, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it adds some confidence. It adds confidence everywhere. You know, I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, yeah it does. How much does the, the initial service cost? Like if a client comes in, uh, it can range anywhere from two hundred to six fifty or so. Units can last from two weeks to four months. And then there's maintenance. That upkeep can be a regular haircut, a way you can take it off, wash it, and put it right back on. I don't recognize myself. What is your typical clientele? At this point, I do more African-American guys than any other race. The Caucasian guys, kind of like, well, I don't really see him post much of our type of hair that much. There's only a few. You need to dip into that white money. <laughs> you tripping that white money. Yeah. Oh, man. That's <laughs> Hair growth is estimated to be a $3.6 billion annual industry. And Wade is using fake hair to make real money. So how much money do you make a year doing just hair units alone? Uh, over 450000 Bruh. We project this year to be way more. You could corner the market. Why are you giving this information away? Because I, I feel like I'm doing this to help other people. I've had guys and, and ladies cry after they had the service done. This is crazy. This is the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. I still can't believe it. This is crazy. <laughs> so when they see it, it's like a shock and it's like, oh my God, it's like, I'm a total different person. 